This is the Free Hill Life Podcast number 25. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we're back for another edition of the Free Hill Life Land extravaganza this week. And I'm really psyched. I've got an awesome guest today, and we're going to talk about some fun stuff. So uh, before that, really the only newsroom, I mentioned it last week, uh, I'm going to be taken a social media break for the summer from the Telemark Skier magazine and Free Heel Life uh, Instagram and Facebook accounts. I'll probably hop on there here and there, you know, with the podcast stuff and uh, the few items that we'll probably be trying to get rid of from the shop. But for the most part, just trying to use this time to prepare uh, better content, we're working on a redo of telemarkskier.com and some other stuff like that. And so because we're such a small outfit, we want to really make sure um, we're taking the time over the summer to just kind of tighten things up and make it better for next year. So all you Australians and uh, people from New Zealand and uh, I, c- I could have called you Kiwis, I guess, and from South America, uh Listen to the podcast, but I'm not going to be posting a lot of photos this round. And I appreciate it always as you guys are able to support that. We'll be back probably like late August, September. So today, I am going to be talking with Pierre Moyad. He's a mechanical engineer, and he was a project manager and department manager in different sectors of the sports equipment manufacturing industry uh, such as fall protection and he was also involved in engineering and aeronautics uh, medical engineering and nuclear he is passionate about snow sliding sports like skate bmx and mountain bike and after 30 years of snowboarding he discovered telemark in 2011 and after a few tests to learn the turn uh, he quickly started thinking about designing a new telemark binding that would be used for the ntn boots so uh in 2014 he created the m equipment and began to market his first binding offering called majo so today's episode we are talking with pierre moyad founder of the m equipment welcome to the show brother how are you fine fine josh very nice review you say everything's about me. <laughs> <laughs> I know we almost don't need to do the podcast right now. <laughs> no, but it's no, no. It, it's good to good to have you uh, on the show. I know it's been a it's it's good for me because this is actually giving me the chance to catch up with all you guys. It's that, a pleasure to discuss with you. <laughs> I know it, it's been a while. I think the last time I saw you was when you brought us over to uh, to the Black Shoes Festival. <laughs> So. Yes, and the Mont Blanc. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got to ski the Valley Blanche together. That was pretty amazing. You know what's the photo of my phone? It's one guy just on the top of the Aiguille de Midi, just going down with his skis, a voily ski. It's Joss Madsen and friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that was an amazing... That was, uh, let's 2017, and... Uh, I looked at those photos the other day. It was like May 4th and there was like, yeah. I mean, a it, it was, a, a incredible powder day. You were lucky. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I remember everybody being telling us like how lucky we were to have fresh snow in May. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very nice trip. Yeah, that was great. Um, and uh, so t- how, how are things going? We, we were talking a little bit before we got onto the actual podcast um yeah how are things in france it sounds like things are kind of uh starting to you guys are starting to move around a little bit it sounds like yes um so uh, in france at the moment so we just start to open to unlock the country there is always some place around paris and northwest not east which uh, have to be some restriction but in most of part of France, we can start to move and uh, for the moment till the end of May we can move 65 miles around home but most of the shops most of the factories start to reopen 
And uh, for for M equipment, we never closed because we have different developments. But in most of there is it start to life start to start again since uh, since one or two weeks. But school are still most of the school are still closed. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it is here too. Mm. Things are starting to move around a little bit, but it's uh definitely not normal <laughs> so, yes it's not normal for sure yeah mountain is helping is asking to come for me to come but i can't <laughs> i know did you see did you see that beautiful uh kind of uh gathering online for the black shoes last week oh yes that was fantastic yeah. so many ideas that was very nice yeah that was that was, that was uh, uh, very crazy. I think I think our friend Kanar would have been very happy to have oh, seen yes. that. Oh yes, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's going to be interesting. Hopefully, getting back to some of these festivals. I I know that Black Shoes. Um, I'm actually doing another podcast later today that'll come out later. That um, I'm going to have me, Taylor, Ashley, and Alex, and we're going to talk about our experience going to the Black Shoes Festival. So <laughs> <laughs> that will be great. It's going to be wild. We'll have to. We'll have to make sure to censor some of the parts out because it we got too crazy. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, cool. Well, um, and so just to let people know, like, um, I guess, w- what town is M Equipment based out of? To give people some context. So I, I create M Equipment where I live. So. When when I create M equipment in 2014, I'm not far from. I'm the, I'm the north of Marseille, so I'm not really based in the Alps, but I'm two hours by car from the first resorts and the mountain. So I'm not based inside the Alps, but not too far from. Uh, I was. I have a home here. My wife has a company here, so it's why we are still here. But my plan is to move in the Alps in the next two years. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's probably hard. I, in for those that haven't been to Marseille, it's right on the coast. I guess is it? Yes. Is it? I didn't even. You know, it's funny as I never even really looked on a map. I know it's right on the water. Is it? Is it like? Oh a, yes, it's a it's an harbor. It's a big harbor. It's a harbor. Yeah, that's what I was. Yes, it's ask. an harbor. It's a it's one of the most old city in the Mediterranean. It's practically a, a bit less than 3,000 years old city. So it's an arbor created by the Greek. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, for um, practically 600 years before Christ. Wow. That's, that's yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I can't wait to come back to there <laughs> in the, in the summertime because it's so, oh, for sure. it's so funny. I think I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but I have never been to Europe in outside of winter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like all these cool places I've been to, like, um, you know, like Marseille, like, I mean, we went down and rode bikes on the coast and the Harbor. And I mean, it was, it was pretty cold, you know, so I can imagine in a beautiful summer, it's gotta be pretty incredible. Always, uh... It's very hot. I cannot translate in Fahrenheit, but it could be 30 to 40 degrees. Water is very hot and wow. it's crowded. But uh, we, we know places where you can swim or practice windsurfing or scuba diving. Very nice place for that. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that. Um, so I guess to kind of, I gave a little bit of introduction and I c- yeah, and that helps I just wanted to kind of give some people an idea of where if you haven't looked, if you haven't been to France, look up Marseille, you can kind of see where it's at and, and, um, in comparison to getting to the mountains and, um, that's where the M equipment is, is located. So did you, did you grow up in Marseille yourself? Yes. Not, not, not exactly in Marseille, but not too far. It's uh, one hour. uh, My parents live a bit less than one hour from Marseille. So I spend most of my time not far from here, where I'm living now. During my studies, I went uh, around Paris for my engineer school. My first job was completely in the north of France. And then after that, uh, after a few years in the north of France, I decided to come back in the south. And since uh, now 25 years, I come back in the south of France. 
So did you did your parents live in the mountains? I mean, you said you're no, t- no, no, no. In mountain, it's I'm a patient of mountain, but my, my father wants uh, me and my brother to learn skis very soon. So I start to ski around six, seven. Oh wow! But um, we, I've. I was not in the mountain all the time, but I was a passionate of of, uh, of mountain. And uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I remember um, in my garage building my first snowboards, uh, made with two pieces of wood. It was the time the the snowboards were equipped with fins below. Oh wow! There were no no edge, but like fins. like the Burton uh, Burton Elite. Oh yes, yes, like the the first, because it was not possible to find snow in France and I don't have the money to find some to get some from the US so we have to build ourselves oh wow that's amazing I didn't know that so you guys were building mm-hmm. the first were you oh, just, yes. were you just making cloth bindings oh the, the first bindings were it I'm losing Rangers shoes it was the military shoes maker with um, oh yeah so. <laughs> I know I know what you're talking and, about kind of those and it weird was a rubber boots strap. <laughs> and it was a foot strap of snow of uh, windsurf, uh, an elastic. Oh. Then after, and after few, one or two years, we we get the first real plastic binding. And then we move to the, um, as in the US, you have really an approach more skateboards. Mm-hmm. So you have the with the soft. In Europe, we are more like alpine. So we had fixed fixed bindings, but I used that for two, three years, and then I switched to, as I practice a lot of snowboards, I bought a Burton snowboards uh, with, uh, with classical um, bindings and, uh, and soft shoes. So at the beginning, you were uh, doing more hard boot stuff? At the beginning, I thought it was like mountain shoes because yeah. there were no, there was no really specific shoes for snowboards. Then after appear the raceless shoes, which is more rigid and yeah. alpine. And then in the beginning of the nineties, I switch directly to to the I get the two two tongue button boots, oh, yeah. which one the, the very those. flexible, very flexible. Like that, I can do my sads, uh, my sad Ollie and <laughs> and sweet. <laughs> and uh, I was more looking for uh, a skateboard practicing of snowboards. I prefer. I was more like a free rider. So did you uh, want to make? Gym. Did you like Damian Sanders? Did you know? You know who he is? I know the names, but I remember the name of my snowboards was uh, Dave Shun. One of my original was Dave Sean, but it was more, I was more really fan of free riders. Because, yeah, I don't, and see, I, I snowboarded for a second. I, th- I think we talked about this because, like, I, I only snowboarded from, like, 89 to 91 or something. I was pretty young when that when Kemper was around, and uh, I don't know if you remember those, but at, do you remember Avalanche Snowboards? That's what I was thinking maybe. Oh, yes. Yeah, Avalanche, Damien Sanders was, like, that crazy. Oh, okay snowboarder that uh he he rode the avalanche kick snowboard and uh but the he was a hard boot guy like a free rider but he rode hard boots with like plate okay. plate binding so anyways i'm uh, i'm not a huge snowboard i like the history of it though it kind of reminds me of telemark a little bit <laughs> but it's true that uh i was at the beginning of snowboards then after as i told you, you mentioned i practice windsurfing so I was more practicing windsurfing, so it's why I prefer to be not far from the sea. But finally, I discovered in the late uh, 10 years ago that my, my real passion is mountain. So it's why uh, I switch and I lost mostly, I discovered Telemark. It was just after a uh, very hard accident. And after that accident, I discovered I make an introspection and said, okay, my real passion is mountain. So oh. now I spend all, most of my time in a mountain. Did you have like a, like a car crash or something? Or? Oh, it was a mountain biking crash. And oh. uh, I, I broke my neck. Oh, what? So, oh wow. yes. So I broke, 
we we call Sasix. It's one of the one of the pieces in the neck. Oh wow! So now I have a, a metal plate in my neck, and I I I was hemiplegic for half an hour. Really? So, oh yes, it was. Uh, oh not, not wow! <laughs> How so and after that and after that uh, that trauma, I realized that I could have not work anymore not walk anymore and what would miss me the most if i had to be hemiplegic or more it's mountain so i said okay so you're a real patient it's mountain so it's why i start to think how can i switch and change my life to be central centered on the mountain and two three years after that i, I start to create the major oh wow Wow, I didn't I didn't know you had that accident. That's wow. That must have been incredibly scary to feel like oh, yes. you could, like you for a half an hour you couldn't move your legs at all. Oh, it was on the left. It was um, arms and uh, but only on the left side. Wow. But it's horrible. It's horrible. Wow. But it was just uh, for a quarter or 30 minutes. So after that you but uh, yeah. you have to. Uh, I, it was my first flight in helicopter. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not. That's probably not what you want. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're thinking to yourself, like, I, yeah, I'd love to go in a helicopter, but probably not under these circumstances. So it was around the same time I discovered Telemark, and probably the same year. Well, yeah. And after that, it was around. 2011 i think the time where i discovered telemark where i was and, and i wanted to talk about that is coming from snowboard did you have some telemark friends or like how no. how did you get introduced to that i'm very sorry but you know the first telemarkers i met it was in 2014 when i present metro really so no oh yes for sure it's true but it, I don't, I, I, excuse me, I, I know one telemarker, it was my cousin. My cousin uh, make this, present me telemarks. But before that, probably I cross, I cross, I met some people. But, you know, when you don't know the sport, you don't take care. Yeah. So I was mostly focused on snowboards and skis. So I start again to practice skis at the beginning, at the mid uh, 2000 to teach my kids how to practice ski and um, but I was mostly practicing snowboards because I was interested in powder and free ride and in ski it was very difficult for me so I continued to practice snowboards but I was interested in touring so I pushed myself to discover the world of touring and my cousin proposed me hey if you want to switch you can switch to telemark. You can do touring and ski. And I said, I cannot buy all the equipment. And he presented me the NTN boots and said, with that shoes, you can do everything. So you can do touring, ski, and, and telemark. But the binding is not, it's very awful. So it was, uh, he was using the Voile binding and he's coming from 75. And he told me that I tried the NTN, it's very heavy. You cannot tour, so you they have to improve the binding. So, and I take the challenge. Wow! Could I create something? So it was just at, at the beginning a game. Could I create something? Because as you told before, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I was very interesting in design. But time by time, I, I changed, and I was mostly a project manager. And after, at 45, I said. Could I create something? In, could I am able to create something? And it was a game at the beginning. So just to try to, to create a, something by using the shoe. So first of all, I start to learn telemark. So I bought a, a nice pair of K2 anti-pistes with a pair of Targa and Garmon shoe. And I tried to learn telemark. But as most of the sport, I started, I learn by myself. I never get a teacher to teach me how to practice telemark. So I learn alone. And after a few few times, I bought a pair of Takes Pro and a Rotofella free ride from the first model 
or two, uh, 2008, 2009. And I test the binding. I said, okay, I understand. I don't like that binding. So I start to create and I start the development of major around 2011, 2012. Wow. So you had, that's, I feel like I did know that, but I guess I must have forgotten that. So you literally didn't really know, other than your cousin mentioning Telemark, you didn't know any Telemark skiers, and then you pretty much learned how to do it on your own, and then you decided to make a binding. <laughs> yeah. So I learned Telemark through video, because there is very nice video on, on the web, through books, from Lionel Condemine, which is a very good friend of me now. And yes, I learned by myself. Wow. But it's, it was an, an old, horrible technique. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think since, all of since, us were. <laughs> <laughs> since I met many people and, you know, what's very nice in that, in that sport, you, even after years, you always have to improve and change, you improve your technique. So it's what it's very nice in that sport. Yeah, did you so, feel like, did you feel, sometimes, we've talked about the snowboard thing, did you, f have you ever oh, felt like to, a toe side turn on a snowboard is similar to Telly? Or do you dispute that? <laughs> no, 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 I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree with this position. I think it's the same feeling. Uh, it's why I'm, I try to motivate people, you love snowboards, try to do Telly. Yeah. You will have, you will have to, sometime, w the lecture, when you look at the on the slope, it's the same vision. Uh, I do sometimes some ski, not so much, but when I'm, if you go off piste, I think the when you look, it's exactly the same way if you practice snowboard or telemark. The turns are a bit the same, the and you have the movement are the same. But uh, since I start tele, to be honest, I really do only telemark since. 214 to 214 and since i just did one day two hours of of snowballs wow. i try again one day because i have a very nice swallow uh, snowboards but um, after two hours i forgot that to be locked if I, because sometimes you have to go into the edge, you sometime uh, on the edge of a mountain. Sometimes you have you start to slow down, and then you have a little up. Oh yes, you have to unclick the shoe, and the liberty of telemark. It's so fantastic. So yeah, totally. <laughs> After two hours, I turn back to the car, put the snowboard in the car, take my pair of skis, and <laughs> return to tele. <laughs> that's awesome. That's that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and that that is. Yeah, the surfiness of the turn, I think, is something that once people realize or learn how to do the technique properly, you know, like that surfy feeling, even on a on piste, is really oh, amazing. Yeah, it's, sure. it's amazing. It's just it, it takes a little bit of time to to learn it. You know, it's not. not I think super easy. a good skier can can go few days. You can have a base of good technique in telemarks. It's true that if I think, in my opinion, if you want to do a good tele, you need some years. But you can get a pleasure after a few, maybe one or two days, you can get a pleasure. If you want to be a very good skier, you need some days, a week or 10 days of minimum of technique. Yeah. It's my point of view. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, and then, so I, th I think I know, but if you explain to the people out there where the word uh major comes from and and just and just so you, all the uh english speakers mm. out there because oh, yes, yes. when it when it came out and we opened the shop we always laughed because people would call us and they would be like uh do you guys have the mojito binding <laughs> or the mojito or the yeah there was like every which way so explain to the people the origin of the name Mejo. So, first of all, uh, there is a very nice place in La Grave, which is uh, the, it's a, a resort uh, where it's on the summit of this resort, it's La Meige. La Meige, it's, uh, it's a 4,000 meter mountain, and it was the last mountain where men were on top. It was 150 years ago. So, 
through the Alps, they, they climb all the mountain and La Meche was the last one. So it's a mythic place because there is a resort, there is only one teleferic to go on top and one re- and there is no piste. So when you leave this that place, it's there is a little panel set. Beside this line, you are under your own responsibility and it's my best place to ski and it's a very nice place to ski and the name the local name of that mountain it's mejo and it's because this area which is in between the north and the south of the alps not far from italy was an italian place and a lot of mountains in the alps are peak du midi you know the peak du midi where we ski together in in in, uh-huh. in Chamonix. It's a peak of midday. It's where the the, the farmer around the mountain, when the sun is on top, on the top of the the peak, it's midday. And midday in Italian, it's mezzogiorno. And as oh. as la mezz was uh, a dialect, an Italian dialect, the peak of La Meige was a peak du Midi, so a peak of Mezzogiorno. And it was Mezzogiorno, and when they contract, it's become Mezzo. Oh, wow. Like midday. Yeah. It's, you can say it's a midday binding. <laughs> that's an, oh, that's amazing. I didn't know that. I knew, okay, so that's great, because I knew La Meige played into it, but I that's kind of cool that it has that, uh, it was sort of a evolution of the Italian version of it. So that's just kind of local dialect for La Meige is made. Yes, it's exactly that. Wow. Okay, cool. That's amazing. And it was really, it was, so it was the last peak that they climbed 150 years ago? Yes. They, they start by the Mont Blanc and then the, uh, you know, at that time it was the mostly the, the British who tried to climb all the mountain in the Alps. And the objective was to climb all the more than 4,000 meters. And it was the last one. Yes. Wow. Because there is a very difficult pass to go on top, and it was the last one, yes. Hmm. Yeah, and it's no joke. Like, if you haven't skied, uh, yeah, and I haven't been to Le Grave, but skiing in Chamonix with you was incredibly eye-opening. And even, it was like one of those experiences, like, even knowing what you're about to do, uh, it the the steepness of, of those mountains and the technical, even walking from uh, the Aiguille du Midi down, like to go mm-hmm. to the Valle Blanche, that was, <laughs> that, that was sp- it's, it's, spicy, my friend, spicy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. One, one thing of the, the La Grave, which is mythic, a lot of people, there is a lot of American guys coming to Chamonix for steep, for steep descent. And, if you want to to go in some place more wild with less people, you go to La Grave. Yeah. So a lot of people do do comb. Do you know the guys do comb? The, the, oh, the Doug, Doug, yeah, Doug Coombs. Doug Coombs. Doug Coombs. Yep. Doug Coombs was lived in La Grave. Yep. So he was uh, he stayed most of the time in La Grave. Yeah, I mean that's that's probably how I heard of it. it was early ski magazine articles with Doug Coombs yeah. but yeah and and one of the ski of Doug Coombs the K2 I think in 214 or 215 it was uh, a Doug Coombs memory skis and there is in uh, the La-, La Grave and there is the teleferic of the on the skis you have the, the different cabins of the teleferic on the skis and and for, for again if you haven't been to Europe teleferic is is like a like a gondola like a tram oh it's a gondola yes yeah. it's a gondola yeah yeah because yeah. we don't yeah so we use the word gondola here but we don't use oh, okay. tel- we don't use teleferique so oh sorry no this no no my, that's that's it okay it's my french translation no i love it and 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 uh <laughs> i think that's what's been so cool about this podcast too is i i feel like just getting the language uh yeah figured out too we we <laughs> someone actually I'm sp- I, I'm speaking Fringlish. <laughs> you know, you're no, you're French. <laughs> you're, you're ang- your English is great. No, I think uh, one of the early podcasts we were jo- it was like me, Ashley, and Taylor. We were joking around about um, ski shoes because we say ski boots, right? And then the French <laughs> always say ski shoes, and and uh, 
we were trying to lay that to rest, you know, and let people know, no, like ski shoes are ski boots. They're the same thing. They're like, don't, <laughs> there's not like a separate, a separate shoe. Uh, yeah. that's a, and that's also, uh, uh, the other French one that I always think is, is interesting is, uh, the fixation, <laughs> the binding, right? Yes. The binding, yes, the binding is a fixation. Yes, it's a fixation. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's uh, that's always one I like too. Because so sometimes when you look on the the, the so software to translate, like Google Translate, when you type uh, fixation, if it fixing, no, no, I know I have to change to binding. <laughs> oh, funny. What what is uh? I I, I was that's funny because I came across genuflexion. Uh, genuflexion. Oh, uh, genuflexion. Uh, genu Genuflexion, it's, you said the telemark stance, it's how to flex. Oh. Genuflexion, it's because the name of the knee is genou, genou. Donc, genuflexion, it's the act to flex the knee. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah. Genuflexion, it's really the act to flex the knee. The act to flex the knee. Okay, perfect. It's, it's really a medical world, if you want Really? If oh yeah, it could be it could be used for by a by a medic, a doctor can do yes, make a, a genuflexion. It's how flex your knee. Wow, that's funny. That's that's interesting because you know, like we always say, drop knees or <laughs> uh, oh, drop knees. Okay, yes. Well, we say I drop think. drop knees, but that's more like flex the knee. So that's that's cool. And 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 the the real word we we use in French, it's la fente. La fente, it's the position when you flex your two, your, your, the knees, but we, and we enlarge the two position of the, of the legs. Exactly, the like telemark stance. Like a lunge. Yes, a lunge. The lunge and the, and the, the French word is la fente. La fente, yeah, the F-E-N-T-E. F, F, yeah. F, e, -E. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I, I, Again, I think it's good to have these podcasts where we talk because I think a lot of us, because of the internet, now we always see these things, you know, these words from these other places. And sometimes it's like, what is La Font? You know, nobody <laughs> knows, nobody knows what it is, you know? So it's, uh, and it's true that because we are using these words through some name of websites, through uh, some jokes. Uh, it's people using this very because la font you can imagine many words about what is a font. Yeah. Because a font it's um, it could be equivalent to the for, for the for example. Oh wow. So there is <laughs> so there is many you can joke with these words. Oh, that's classic. The the <laughs> the, the double entendre of uh, yes of uh, the the French words. Uh, the uh um so, so okay so getting into making these bindings i i was kind of curious like what has been the most difficult part of making this stuff on if uh, when i try to to develop the major my first thing when i remember when i i tried the first time the the targa so it was the n75 i never did a carpet test so i directly put my material on the snow and I tried to put my shoes inside the binding and to lock on my um, on the heel of the shoe. And I have to, I tried, and the ski was sliding everywhere, and I, I passed practically 10 minutes just to lock my binding because the cartridge was not set correctly. I have to understand how it works. And I said, why it's not stepping? Mm. Because when you're skiing, it's very easy. And when and you're you talking about the free ride, was what you were trying to? Oh say? no, no! I even even for the after that, no, it was mostly on the seventy-five. Why oh, it's not it. stepping? When I try I test the free ride, okay, I have to open something, and then I put my shoes inside. If there is a ski break, it's not so easy, and then I have to lock. So for the first, you lock with the shoe. For the second one, so you have to to bend your body and press with the hand or use your ski. And I said it's not normal. It have to be very. It, you have to be very simple and easy stepping. So that was my first goal, and then the second it was to very easy to use for touring. So it's why immediately I think I have to use a low tech in front and find 
some things that can clip the shoe on the second heel. Mm. And that's why I developed the concept of Mejo with this little bar below. That was the concept, the first of the concept. And then I tried to... So when I get the idea, the second step, very difficult, it's what is what telemarkers are waiting for. Do they want to power, flex? That was something I, I, I have to develop. It's where have to be the position of the mechanism and what have to be the strength of the, of the, of the springs. Mm. The length of travel of the springs. The, so a long, tra- long work was to find the best position for what I call the pivot, what I call the pivot point yeah, of the spring box, yep. and uh, the dimension of the springs, and uh, the the strength of the springs, and that take me a long time to develop, and uh, um, so I make different prototypes. Friends uh, help me to make some mathematics to to optimize the development. That was a long time to, for the development of Mejo. And when I find the best, I said, I think that is the best for me. I present the binding to, to my cousin. He make a test and said, it works. And I present the binding the first time at the Mejo Festival, which is a festival in La Grave. And people told me, yes, Pierre, it's good. But after I have to continue to improve, but I find the best position where is because the, 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 um, on the Mejo, the big difference as with the classical topis binding, as the, bind, uh, the shoe can turn around the pin. So you have to find a different position, what we can say, the cable, to, to create a triangle of forces, to, create, to keep the front of the shoe flat, but give you the possibility to flex the below and to do the, the, the telemark flex. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's so fascinating knowing that you, I mean, not having a long history with telemark and then you're trying to figure out all of these different parts of it, like the pit, like a pivot point, different spring tensions. I mean, that must've been incredibly more difficult just because you didn't really have a whole lot of history with it. (laughs) I mean, at least it would seem that way. Josh, I can tell you that. I can say yes. Oh, you just, I'm a very good engineer. To be honest, I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I remember when we first saw that. When we first saw the the first Majo, I was like, "Whoa!" I mean, it was just so. I mean, it, the the way that it fit onto the ski, you know, it, it it was NTN, but just the components were so different than anything mm-hmm. we had seen before. And, um, and you know, that, that brings up another question that I've always wondered too, is how did you, or when did you come up with the idea to separate the release function from the other spring system? Um, when I design, uh, I remember during your visits, uh, I present you my, the first, the prototypes. Uh, when I start to develop the binding, my I had the idea to to integrate the the release system, but it was not the most important things for me. It was to create a binding that works first. Yeah, and then I said, okay, there is a space I can imagine to integrate uh, a safety system, but one of my critic on the on the rotofella system that you cannot separate the two systems. Okay, uh, I can imagine that a very good guys, uh, we want to have a lot of liberty, so, so, so a lot of freedom of in this flex could release very easy. And some one which is scared about flex, or we want to use very stiff springs, will never release. So uh, in my mind, so it's not possible to connect these two systems, even if it works. It works. Uh, I used the freedom for two years, and I released some uh, one time, so it works. But you cannot adjust uh, as the the tension you want. So my idea was okay. 
I'm look, I would look on this key binding and I said, okay, marker of a system that you can release in the front and the system is, there is small springs inside, it works. So I can imagine to integrate that on the binding. And it was my idea. But one of the problems is of the system that you cannot evacuate the snow inside. So oh, I can inside, imagine, the, I, inside the spring. It, Inside the springs, because when the clamp on the anti end clamp, if you're looking on the rotofilla, you have some holes where the snow can go out. One of the problems I can imagine that that can block someone. Okay, if I put a, a safety system here, where the snow can goes out, mm. it's not possible. So I can imagine that some other people can have this idea and they said, no, it's too risky. I take the risk. It works. Yeah. I think that's one of the features that's, um, you're the only one that's done it. And it's one of the most fascinating parts of it because for people that know NTN systems, that is, has always been the issue is, mm -hmm. um, that if you want, and, and just, I guess for the listener out there, just to clarify, basically on all NTN systems, except the Majo, you usually have two springs or a single spring that as you tighten the spring to get more tension, you increase or you decrease the ability to release from the binding. So it doesn't give you a lot of options in terms of like in, with the Majo, if you like a softer flex, um, you can have a soft flex, but you can have uh, you can crank down the releaseability so you don't come out as easy. It just gives you more, you know, more options like, you know, it's not DIN certified, but it's more like a DIN concept on an Alpine binding. So you have more uh, ability. But yeah, I've always wanted that. That's cool to hear kind of your thought process behind that. I'm actually surprised that um, that no one else has tried that <laughs> since you did it. Because now I yes, now I, I now I see it and I'm like I'm like oh wow I mean that seems like the kind of a future thing that all just like Alpine bindings all have din you know it seems mm -hmm. like at some point we we'll probably should get into the realm of all NTN or all let me say all Telemark bindings because oh yes it, for sure it, you know it'll I all be on that platform you. but this is for me one thing is very, very important it's safety yeah. It's, uh, uh, and a lot of people, the customer, told me yes, uh, because we find after that we find and uh, I found different thesis about safety in ski and even on telemark. And there was a very nice thesis in France and in Germany about the risk in telemark. And I heard many people said, okay, yes, as I'm free, I can flex. It's less dangerous for my knees. It's false. The statistic there is exactly the same numbers uh, of accident in Telemark or in ski. Interesting. And it's exactly the same. It's ex there is no. We can imagine there is more or less. It's equivalent. Is it? So, so you're saying so? The, that is a. Te uh, uh, oh, it's a, a thesis. I can send you. A yeah, document. I would. Yes. I would love to see that. You know, because that's a that's a really common question that comes up often. Is is it bad for your knees or are there more injuries? I, yeah, that'd be a, that'd be great to see that. I don't know if I've seen There is one. the same risk. There is the same risk. Yeah. So, and we can imagine that, I don't know in the US, but in Europe, most of the time, telemarkers are good skilled skiers. Most of the time when you do telemark, you have very good basis. So when you have a good level in ski, you can imagine that you have less accident but it's false the statistic is no there is exactly the same percentage of accident in telemark or in ski hmm. yeah yeah we probably need more statistics uh sometimes i feel like we don't have or, or i don't hear there is uh, some but it's not easy to find right yeah i know that's why when you brought it up i was like yeah you need to send that to me i'm like i don't know <laughs> if i've read that one. Oh man well so if you had to go back in time with the whole creating process, would you 
would you have done anything differently or do you feel like it's kind of, I mean, nothing goes as planned, right? But it did, if, if you had to, if you had to talk to, to your younger self and say, <laughs> Hey, Pierre, this is a bad idea. Don't, don't do this part of it. Like, would you change anything or would you just do it the same? On, on the design of the binding, maybe some points now with the experience, I say you have to improve some points. It's why I, I have the evolution on the major. And I know that uh, for me, even if you will have the major three, my level, uh, my target is higher than the major three. But uh, uh, I think at the moment, uh, what I will, you will have on the major three, it's what I can do the most, the best for the moment. But if I had to, I don't think I will have, the design will be different. But maybe after time, I was a bit crazy to create DM equipment. <laughs> <laughs> to get, to, you, no. you, you were crazy to start it all. <laughs> oh, yes. It's mostly, well, uh, I, I regret nothing. It's a fantastic history and I met so nice people. And so the, the, the family of Telemark, it's, that was the most uh, fantastic things I discovered through this history. The people I meet are so, so nice. And never that. Uh, I practice several sports, but it's really in the Telemark family. For me, it's my family now. It's uh, it's my best friends are in the Telemark now. But uh, I was crazy to take that risk, so invest <laughs> so much money and to to invest by all that mold, spend that time. So, so it's um, it's a full time, but it's um, <laughs> during the few years it was a seven days work a week. So yeah, just. Uh, but it's a fantastic story. Yeah, no, no, and I, I think we all appreciate it. I mean, those of us who have been around this stuff for a long time, I mean, it is not an easy road. I mean, it's oh, for sure. And and I think all all companies, uh, all business are not easy road. But on the telemark, I was lucky that there is. It's a small business. Right. Few few competitors. And so it, it, it was a risk. I was lucky because the, pro, the, the, the product was not so bad. But uh, yes, at the end, I was lucky. Yeah. Because I could have lost a lot of money. But yeah, no, it's... I'm still alive. So that's <laughs> important. No, I mean, and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be, yeah, like I, I just, uh, I did a little kind of talk about that, like uh, uh, on a, I did a podcast kind of talking about my ideas with like a telemark industry. And I mean, you are one of the few companies that is a true telemark company. You're making mm -hmm. stuff specifically for telemarkers. If we, if telemark actually was dead, you would cease to exist. So, um, mm -hmm. it, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome, man. And I, especially with man, I mean, with, uh, everything going on with coronavirus around the world and everything like that, you know, I think, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see in the fall, you know, um, kind of what skiing looks right. like. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think we're a resilient bunch of people and, and that, that if, if, if you've got some info for the next winter, I would be interested. <laughs> if what? If you've got some info, what will be the business in next winter? I know. Yeah. It's funny. I was talking to, uh, Chris from 22 designs yesterday and we were kind of saying the same thing. It's like a weird it's like a, it's a strange time in the sense that yeah. you kind of you can't even imagine what things are necessarily going to look like in six months. I mean, it's yes, really it's very strange. <laughs> so you have to organize how many pairs and quantities will the customer will be there. Yeah. If if there is an if there is another lockdown in six months, you don't know. But we have to go through and continue to work and yep. do our best. No, I agree. I agree. And and one of the you know one of the things you said too, and I I think it is very true, and it's cool to hear you say this. Is just like the community around um, Telemark, and even some of the people I was able to meet coming. I I, I will always be grateful that you brought us out there because I think meeting some of the French telemark skiers was honestly one of the coolest 
experiences that I've ever had. And I don't, I, uh, you know, we went to the black shoes festival and obviously meeting all of those people was fantastic and completely crazy. I mean, that, what an amazing time that was. And I keep saying to people like that is when, when things get back to normal and we can go, uh, to teen, we need to go back to teen because that is phenomenal. Oh, you're welcome. You know, yeah, you know that you you will be welcome. Well, so. I was I was gonna say, t- you know, that pro- that that reminds me too. And thank you. I would love to come back. That would be a lot of fun to see those guys. Um, and uh, I was gonna say too. One of the when did you, uh, when did you meet, uh, Seb Mayer, <laughs> and how did oh, that? How did that all come about? And um, in Eve, Eve, I think is Eve Eve the filmer, right? Oh yes, yes. So as I told you, I was lucky. Uh, the first in two fourteen, before create DM equipment, I just I the, the the company was not create, but the product was not far to be finished. And I went to ISPO. It's equivalent to the SIA in in, in Europe. And I don't know if I was able to use or not the NTN clamp. I don't know if I was allowed to do, oh, to because, do it. Because of, I don't, pat, because of patent. Because of patent. So I went to the, the ISPO to look if somebody was creating the same product as me because I don't know all the competitors on the market. And I visit uh, different companies like Scarpa, Crispy, Scott. And during my during these two days I was in Munich, uh, I was on a crispy boot, and I, I I spoke with a with Guido, which is in commercial and marketing, and I present him my project. Say, okay, I want to develop that binding, and you are the producer of the shoes, and I ask him, could I use the clamp, NTN clamp? And he told me, yes, no problem. And uh, it was not really, <laughs> there is a way to use it. But he said, you can, and what do you think of my project? And he said, I don't know, but you could ask to our team, uh, team representative, Sam Mayer. Uh, he was, I was lucky because he spent one hour during all the festival in Ispo, and I was at the same time with him on, in the booth. And I met him on the ISPO. He gave me his card and I contacted him two years, two, two months later to present him the first prototype to test it. That's crazy. So you literally so, just walked into ISPO and uh, yeah, uh, talked to Crispy and Seb just happened to be there. Yes. Wow. And I don't know who he was. Huh. I discover, I discover uh, time after time who was that guy. <laughs> And uh, he won uh, nine, eight times the David Lamege in Telemark. He's a, he's a crazy skier, you know. He's a very good skier. Yeah. So I met him at that time. Then after that, I was I present my first prototype. Four months after, I present the fir- first prototype at the Mejo and then at the Black Shoes. And during the Black Shoes Festival, I met Emmerich. You know the one, the, uh, the second guys of the serial eaters. Oh, okay. Yep. So there is Seb and Emric, which is uh, his buddy, and uh, Emric said, "Oh, I have a friend who can make some films." And say, "Okay, let's go." And he present me Eve, and we start the uh, serial eaters project together. That's amazing, and yeah, for those of you out there, I'm sure we'll try to get Seb Mayer on here, but Seb is one of the strongest telemark skiers you will probably ever see um phenomenal and the serial healers project is some of the great um it's just great telemark footage so yes the goal of that film it was they're using major i don't i'm not sure that because i don't ask to to eve to make a focus on the binding yeah my goal said i saw many films of ski, they make jumps, go fast. And, okay, this is funny. It's always the same. But look on Telemark. There is very good guys in Telemark too. Yep. So one of my goal of the Saya Lila project is that we can do very high-level ski even in Telemark. 
So when I, we start the project, one of my objectives was to say, you can do what you want. I don't want to see avalanche. I don't want you to take risk. And I, am, I need a feedback every evening. So the, you can do what you want, but I don't want to call your, your friends that there is a problem because, of, uh, because you take risk for me. So that was the objective. After that, uh, Seb and Emmerich said they are very, they, they want to go in steep descent and to show, they will always go in the, where it's, it's very funny because when Eve presents a view of the mountain, I can't tell you exactly where they will go because <laughs> they look at the steep at descent and they will go through this couloir because it's the most difficult to do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And yeah, that's, that's cool to hear too. Cause like, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, it's cool that you were like looking out for them from a, uh, production perspective too, because you know, it, again, it's not, you, the mountains are dangerous, you know? So, I mean, sometimes when people watch these videos, um, there's a lot that goes into the safety aspect of it too. So that's, that's cool to hear that you kind of had that relationship with them at the beginning where you're, you know, wanting them to stay safe and, you know, it's not just, Hey, go ski the craziest oh, yeah. thing on no, no, no. that you can find. But for... You can imagine that, but, uh, it's friends. So yeah, uh, for sure. I, uh, so friends and, and you don't want to lose a friend. So, so I was, uh, I, sometimes I was during the filming and I saw sometimes problems happen. Say, okay, I don't want the problems happen because of my material. Yeah. So that was, uh, uh, very good experience for me to see because they push the material at the limit. Yeah. So you have, um, and I sometimes thanks them a lot because they are very confident on what I'm doing. I know that uh, you ski with Emric and, and Seb, they go so fast. Yeah. And oh, they go they fast. Have to be very <laughs> they go fast. They have to be very confident into the material. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm not a very big company. We can make a million of tests. So I make the test I can, and they trust me. And so I thank them a lot that they trust in, in me so much. So it's why. So as I told you, I was lucky to meet that guys Eve, uh, Seb, and Emric at yeah. the beginning of the project. Yeah, that's really cool. And yeah, what a good way to be able to test bindings on, on a high level for sure, you know. Mm. Um, well, I think I'm not going to go too deep into it. I know just if if you have, if the listeners haven't checked out, uh, Craig Dosty and I did a over full overview of Majo and the Majo 3.0 that's coming out this fall. Um, but I wanted to ask you... Um, we were curious about this and this, I'm curious to hear what you say about this because there was, uh, there was some drawings that popped up on the internet a while ago. <laughs> Did you hear about this? Or, uh, so, on the new, on the new binding or, uh, yeah, so, or on the major three? Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm assuming it's a new binding. There was some pictures that popped up on a <laughs> forum somewhere that yes. looked, looked like top secret M equipment, but it's not top secret because it's a patent and it's published now. Oh, okay. So it is, so it's out there. Okay. But it's to, it, the no, most noticeable thing I saw was that binding does not have a tech toe. And I wondered if you yeah. could tell us a little bit about it. So yes, it's true. It's a real project. I start, uh, I start, when I imagined the project of Mejo, I remember that I said there will be three different bindings. First binding, it's a tecto binding. The second will be a piece binding. The third one will be a piece binding DIN certified. That was my project six years ago. And after the de development of Mejo, I start to develop a classical toe binding because it could be cheaper more simple. And because telemarkers are used to have a metal toe piece in front of the shoe. So 
tech toe, it's very specific. So I can understand that people could be afraid about the tech toe and they prefer to have a, med- a large, like a, um, a, a Rotofella Freeride or, a, or an Outlaw, a classical topi. But I know that that kind of bindings hurts a lot of the shoe. If you're looking on a, on a shoe after one you one years oh, of yeah. use on a free ride, yeah, the free rides the, were terrible on the boots. Well, terrible for the shoe. <laughs> so I said I have to develop a binding that could you have the same feeling on the major as the major, and don't hurt the shoe, and that could, and it's why I start to develop this this project. Uh, oh, I start in. I think to 16 to 15 to 16 it take a long time. Oh wow. And 2 years ago we find a nice solution and it's uh, it's what is developed in this patent. It's a floating toe piece. So it's floating. a concept floating. So what I call the floating it's that the toe piece is not fixed. Whoa. Is 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 moving. It's kind of is, I recreate a kind of tech toe but through a toe piece. And we find the best position of the, this articulation of the toe piece, and that gives you a lot of power. So with a single spring, it could be more powerful practically than an outlaw. So for people who are looking for a binding very power, but with what I call a round flex, it's a, the same flex as the major, which is very progressive. So I developed that and I present that project to the shops uh, last year. And I said, okay, I need numbers to invest in that project. And most of the shops told me, uh, we prefer tech too. So it's why we work on a major tree. But we start again to, tr- to work. And I have, I'm waiting to go to the mountain to test my first real prototype of that binding. Oh wow! So you have you actually have a prototype at home? Yeah, I have a I have a prototype since one years, but I put away from me for for one years. But I start to work again since two three months, and my goal is to to test this binding in the next coming weeks. Wow! Amazing. Do you think? Uh... That's cool. Thanks for sharing that. I love that. <laughs> the inside <laughs> scoop on the new on the new binding. Do you know where when when would since Major 3 is going to come out in the fall? Do you think yeah. we're still like another year past that beyond that? Probably to more, to be honest, yes. Yeah. Probably you will have some prototype to, to test next winter. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the the goal is to be to be able to sell it uh, for two twenty one. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, like we said, it's kind of like nobody knows what the hell is going on right now, <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> hard to tell. No, like. it's 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 one of the project we're working on, and then, but you will really appreciate that project. I cannot tell you everything for the moment, but uh, it will be a, a peace binding, but with many innovation features yeah i yeah, many features i love that and i think that's what that's that's what's been so cool having you making stuff and your your version and and ideas and then seeing 22 designs doing stuff it's like there's all these cool things that you guys are coming up with that are, man I, I i always tell people as someone who's been telemarketing for like 25 years this is actually one of the most interesting times in terms of bindings for sure i mean there's oh yes ton, true. there's a lot of stuff going on so mm. but. it's true that between the with the more help that moonlight will really be present in the market uh, 22 is working the b-shop is coming back yep so it's, it's an interesting time yes yeah it is a very interesting time well cool well um is there anything else going on with M equipment that we should know about, like in the next little while that you want to talk about? Oh, for the month, we are working to be ready for next uh, to be to to ship the binding in uh, the end of September for the major three. We continue to work. One important point: it's on the. It was one of my objective. It's the, to reduce the maximum as we can our impact on the. On the environment, so it was a big evolution. And, uh, f- 
So we work on the binding, we introduce the bioplastic in the, on the bindings, we change some process to reduce the impact of the processing, we change the packaging, and we introduce eco-friendly developments. Uh, so we have some helps for that. And I work with friends to, to improve all the strategy of the company around to reduce our impact. Oh, I love that, man. Yeah, I should. I I'll, I'll have to give you a, give you a call later and, and go over all that because I know I did I did get those uh, uh, P backs renew. Yeah. Uh, they're more bio friendly plastic flexors. So, um, yeah. And we, we are we are working to give you. We introduce this plastic, uh, which is something available, but it's a it's a policy to decide to use this material because it's very it's very more expensive. But it's a policy decision. Yeah. But we will come with with numbers to prove that okay, we change that and we improve, we reduce this impact of that value on that part, on, and we reduce the packaging and we improve in that value. So we are making some analysis to give numbers. Yeah, that's cool, man. I'm, I, it's good to know that uh, telemark companies are thinking about that stuff too. That's super important. So, And you will you will have numbers that telemark industry will be better than the ski industry. <laughs> that's what I like to hear, my friend. <laughs> I know we're small, but we're a tough group. So I know yeah. we, got, we work hard. So I appreciate that. Well, cool, man. Well, I really appreciate you uh, coming on Thank and just- you thank you for uh all that you're doing for the sport and and the things that you're innovating and just you know taking the risk i think you know one thing i've i've it's been good about this podcast is the chance that i get i mean i i, I want to be able to thank you like from everybody because i know how much of a risk it is to take to do this stuff and and i just i, I know we all appreciate it but you may not hear it from a lot of people. They probably, they may or may not understand. So I hope, I hope this podcast kind of sheds some light on, you know, how, <laughs> how much work goes in and, you know, um, this is how we support the telemark industry is by buying products from, from people like you. So thanks for you, Josh, too. you are doing a great job. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And for all those that, uh, of you that are listening out there, um, how you can support us, um, you can always uh, support the content by making a donation of your choice to paypal.me slash freehealthlife. You can check out uh, freehealthlife.com. We've still got a couple things on sale there, and then we'll be uh, restocked kind of late summer uh, with a bunch of new stuff. Uh, articles and reviews on telemarkskier.com or you can check out the Telemark Skier Magazine YouTube page or you can always email me at podcast at freehealllife.com. Thanks for listening and until next week, spread Telemark always, my friends. Peace. <laughs>